Family and friends gathering for Philip Seymour Hoffman's funeral Friday. The actor's sudden death last week turning a spotlight on what one governor has called a full-blown heroin crisis. Our experts weigh in shortly. First, our Dr. Richard Besser. An Oscar winner dead with a syringe in his arm after 23 years of sobriety. It says to me that, you know, I'm not invincible, even though I've been clean and sober for 10 years. Once a college student trying to score heroin on the Philadelphia streets. This is a hot, hot corner here. Jeff Dini is now a social worker yeah. helping others yeah. get clean. There's needles, needles everywhere. The ground is just completely carpeted with used syringes. You know, there's heroin bags, glassine envelopes, like it comes packaged in Philly. We done. Yeah, a little brand stamp. Between 2007 and 2012, the number of heroin users just about doubled to 669,000. Heroin, a narcotic, in effect rewires the brain, suppressing all other instincts, slowing down an addict's nervous system, and too high a dose. Their brain essentially doesn't remember to breathe. So these people can stop breathing, and that's actually the most common cause of death. In 2011, there were more than 250,000 ER visits related to heroin use. And there's a new path into addiction. Four out of five new addicts turn to heroin after starting on prescription pain pills, narcotics like OxyContin. The thing is that OxyContin is a lot more expensive than heroin, about four times more expensive than heroin. So that progression from pills, from Oxycontin to heroin, that's not unusual? Oh, it's, it's absolutely not unusual. Cheap, coming in mostly from Mexico, heroin has spread beyond city slums. Governor Peter Shumlin has seen Vermont's heroin deaths double in just the past year. What started as an Oxycontin and prescription drug addiction problem in Vermont has now grown into a full-blown heroin crisis. You can buy heroin on the streets of New York for less than a six-pack of beer? It used to be that bags of heroin were called dime bags. They would cost $10. Uh, but now we see dime bags going for $6, $7. $6 for heroin. Sure. Last week, a victory for the DEA and New York City's special narcotics prosecutor, Bridget Brennan, police dismantling a heroin mill in the Bronx and seizing more than $8 million worth of drugs. This is one of 13 kilos of heroin, each packed in chili powder to avoid detection from drug-sniffing dogs. One brick holds about 30,000 doses. What I've seen is if there's a big supply of drugs out there, people are going to use them. We've seen it with heroin. We saw it with the prescription pills. In America, nearly 24 million people are addicted to alcohol or drugs. Yet only one in 10 will choose treatment. What could she have done to get you into recovery? At that point, there wasn't anything that she could do. Nothing. I wanted to use. I was 19. You know, I, I wanted to get high. That's what I wanted to do. Let's dig into this with our experts. Rich is here with us, along with Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin and Seth Manukin, a journalist who's battled heroin addiction and written so powerfully about it. Seth, and I, I want to start with you. We all look at those images of, of Rich down on those railroad tracks with syringes. It's not the image I would get of you. You, you had a perfectly wonderful upbringing. You went to Harvard. Tell us about how you make that leap. How do you decide to use heroin? I think um, probably the best way I have to describe it is it happened slowly and then all at once. Um, by the time I started using heroin, I had been a daily drug user um, on and off since I was 15 or 16. Marijuana, Marijuana alcohol. alcohol, anything I could get my hands on. Um, and so with heroin, it was uh, an issue of availability. Um, I was living in New York, and one Sunday morning, uh, it seemed like a good thing to do. Um, and Because you thought it was cool, because you... I think for me, a, a big thing was that I knew that I was addicted to drugs, um, it didn't have the stigma for whatever reason. I think partially because I had been able to cope for so much of my life. I had graduated from college. Um, so all of the consequences that I had been warned of didn't seem like they applied somehow. Governor Shumlin, you are in one of the most rural states in the country. Again, you just don't think about a lot of heroin users. I want to read these figures. We heard some of them in Rich's piece. Vermont is in the top 
10 states for abuse of painkillers and prescription drug abuse. Two million worth of heroin is trafficked in Vermont every week. People treated for heroin increased nearly 800% since 2000. What segment of your population is using drugs? You clearly saw this as a crisis. Well, you know, I think here's the point. I mean, Vermont has one of the best qualities of life in the country, and Vermont is no different than the other states. I think the difference is that we've got a governor and a law enforcement, a community who's willing to address it. And really the question for us is, you know, not so much why it's happening, but how do we deal with what's happening? And the challenge with this disease, and it is a disease, is that nobody wants to talk about it, and nobody wants to change the way we're doing business. Now, and when, nobody knows how it's changed. And nobody and knows how it's changed. And, you know, let's be honest about this. Oxycontin and the other... Uh, uh, opiates that are now prescribed, approved by the FDA, uh, lead folks to opiate addiction. Now in Vermont and much of the country, uh, Oxycontin on a street is more expensive than heroin. So folks move from FDA approved drugs to heroin and then it's a lifelong battle, a lifelong addiction. And the question for us all is how do we deal with this better so that we reduce crime and get these folks back into productive lives. Rich, I want to go to you about that lifelong addiction. Yeah. There's the notion that no matter how long you're sober, and you know this well, Seth, that you can go back. Russell Brand, the British comedian and recovering heroin addict, said this this week, there is a predominant voice in the mind of an addict that supersedes all reason, and that voice wants you dead. This voice is the unrelenting echo of an unfulfillable void. Once you start using, what happens to the brain? I mean, you, as we discussed in, in that piece, there's a rewiring of the brain. You know, you have these chemicals in your brain that, that make changes. And one of the lessons that comes from Philip Seymour Hoffman's death is that it is a lifelong problem. And everyone I talk to who's an addict or was an addict say that they are always a recovering addict. Not that it's something in their past they never have to worry about. I just want all of you quickly, in about 30 seconds, to say what You've got, a, you've got a governor here. What has to happen now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think there are three things. Prevention, treatment, and risk reduction. You have to control those pills. You have to keep the drug out of the country. For treatment, I know you're focused on this in Vermont, making sure those waiting lists go away so people can get care, and the Affordable Care Act helps with that. And then risk reduction, making sure addicts can stay alive so they can get to treatment. And Seth. I think one, we've, we've come a long way in terms of destigmatizing alcoholism and drug addiction, but I think we're not fully there yet. Um, and even in the way we talk about relapse, if someone has... You still hear that voice, I'm sure, chronic, that unrelenting voice. Well, I, I do, and it's something that I need to be conscious of. But if someone has diabetes or if someone has high blood pressure, no one would be surprised if then that acts up on them later on in life because those are chronic diseases and people have relapses. Um, drug addiction and alcoholism is something that you need to keep constant watch on to make sure that you can stay in recovery. Governor, we have about 10 seconds to just tell me what's next. We've got to you. stop thinking we can solve this with law enforcement alone and treat it as a disease just like any other disease. And you know, when you think about it, if folks smoke cigarettes, they get cancer, we feel compassion. This is no different. And we've got to move a judicial system and a healthcare system to a system where we're treating this as a disease. Thank you very much, all of you.